Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. And I'll tell you, when you sit back and take a look at power, politics, and the grid, it is a mess. But today we have an absolutely fabulous guest. We are going to talk about his five part docuseries, and it's on juicetheseries.com. It is Juice, Power, Politics, and the Grid. At first, we're going to go ahead and pay about a, play about a 30-second intro clip with Meredith Angwin, and then we are also going to uh, jump right on into the podcast, sit back, enjoy, and I truly enjoyed my visit with Robert Bryce. Uh, thank you very much. Difficult to keep it stable, more difficult to provide power in a reliable manner, more expensive, can game it by taking a couple plants offline and watching the clearing price soar. Taking plants offline in the old grid didn't do you any good. In the new grid, it does. That new grid Meredith's talking about wasn't designed to prioritize consumers. The old grid, the one built by people like Edison, Insul, and others, ensured reliability because if electricity isn't reliable, it's not affordable. Thank you, Robert, for stopping by. I appreciate you. Awesome. Glad to see you, Stu. I'll tell you what, I, a little inside baseball, you and I and Meredith had a pace, uh, a uh, another podcast and I love Meredith and I love the whole messaging that she has in there as well, too, with nuclear. She's in your series, though, right? Yes. And if I could just say a couple of quick things, one is juice the series dot com. Did I mention juice the series dot com? If I didn't, <laughs> let me just say juice the series dot com, Stu. OK, uh, our new five part docuseries juice power politics and the grid. Five part docuseries, 20 minutes each. We talk about the fragility of our, what the importance of the electric grid, why it's being undermined, and what we need to do to fix it. So, uh, it's a project I worked on with my colleague Tyson Culver for three years, came out uh, at the end of January. I'm really very proud of it. And uh, we've had over half a million views already, really getting good traction with it. So, really encourage people to, uh, to check it out, share it, think about it, talk about it. Juicetheseries.com. Did I mention Juice the Series? I hope I mentioned. I love that. Now, here's the other thing. Um, you had a premiere, I believe, in Denver. Uh, you had a uh, opening event, I believe, in Denver. And That's Doug right. Sandridge and also Chris Rice were there, weren't they? Chris Wright from Ener uh, Liberty Energy. That's right. And Doug Sandridge, who's uh, the founder, the president of Oil and Gas Executives for Nuclear uh, they were there. We showed it at the IMAX Theater in Denver back in uh, Jan January 9th. Uh, great, great event. Um, we've done other now screenings um, in Dallas. We did a screening in Tulsa. Uh, we did the oh, Dallas event at SMU. We, SMU. we showed it at the Circle Cinema in Tulsa, the historic Circle Cinema. And then we showed it also in Gray Horse, Oklahoma, which is uh, the historic uh, ceremonial center of the Osage tribe. Uh, we showed episode three. Um, and in uh, Gray Horse, which was meaningful for me, uh, Stu, if I can just take a, a, just a point of personal privilege. I'm All five of these episodes really matter to me, but episode three is particularly personal. I'm from Oklahoma. I have deep roots in Oklahoma. My, wow. great, my great uncle, Ernie Rapp, was a member of the Osage tribe. He was born in Fairfax, Oklahoma in 1909. And so he had a front row seat to the reign of, of terror in the 1920s. Oh, and Wow. The, the the history of the Osage and the 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 story around Killers of the Flower Moon, which of course is Scorsese's movie. And all yes, that, that that history is not ancient history by any means. In fact, the episode three we show how Enel, the Italian company, came into Osage County, violated the tribe sovereignty by putting eighty four wind turbines up on their traditional land, violated mm -hmm. the state, and uh, now a federal court judge has ordered those turbines to be taken down. But we have five episode, five interviews with Osage tribal members in episode three, Green Dreams. I, I did, we did Tyson did a great job stitching it all together, but it's just an incredible story, an incredible story about the Osage um, and the the tribe tribal members that I've known for a very long time, um, and we're privileged to be able to tell their story. That is outstandingly cool. And and your Substack, what's your Substack? I 
Bitch. Robertbryce.substack.com. Did I say robertbryce.substack.com? Yes, I did. And I'm a stalker on that as well, too, because I absolutely love your material. And you have been talking a lot about the wind and, and yeah. how all that happens with that and that lawsuit. Yeah. No, it's a it's a it's a landmark ruling uh, by the federal court judge in Tulsa. The battle over that wind project is the longest running legal battle over wind energy in American history. And wow. You know, it's gotten no play whatsoever in the New York Times, it completely ignored by the Washington Post, Associated Press, or the rest of it. But it's an incredibly important story and one that um, the fact that the tribe has won now is a demonstration of the, you know, a, a, a big win for tribal sovereignty, huge win for the Osage. And now all the Osage tribal members we've talked to say they want those turbines taken down. And and Nell has estimated it's going to cost them $300 million to take them down. How many... It's about 500,000 just to remove uh, the cement and steel at the bottom of these crazy things. It's going to be an insanely expensive. And Stu, when that happens, I am going to be in Fairfax and Burbank, Oklahoma to watch it happen. I, I, and I, 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 I want to be there, too. And, and let me know. I, I cannot wait because I want to film you and just be there to do a live podcast from there, if you don't mind. Oh well, no! I, mean, I think it's a now. Enel is trying to still trying to 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 fight the decision. Uh, they're doing as much legal maneuvering as they can, but it's an, an, a very important ruling. But I think the other broader point, and it's as I said, it's episode three of the docu series. Um, all five episodes are really important. We start with episode one, where we talk about Winter Storm Uri and and what had happened here in Texas. Episode right. two, we talk about Enron and uh, the, it's called Undermined by Enron, the uh, the effect that Enron has had still today in electricity, the electricity right. set in the United States. Green Dreams, I mentioned episode three. Episode four is called The Nuclear Renaissance. We'll go to Canada and talk about why Canada is leading the nuclear comeback globally. And then the last one we quote uh, extensively and as featured is our friend Emmett Penny, uh, who talks about nuclear cathedrals and why we need long-term thinking about the electric grid and nuclear power is, you know, an obvious example of this long-term thinking that we need to have when we think right. about the stability of the grid, the future reliability, affordability, resilience, et cetera. So uh, yeah. that's the rundown over the five episodes, but uh, juice, the series.com. I think I mentioned juice, the series.com. I, I absolutely love you, Robert. I, you, you are one of the greatest guys out there. And in your older movie that was out in 2019, yeah. I was sitting there watching that and you, you get it. It starts out with you in bed and you, and you start heading out. That's on Amazon as well. People need to see that one as well, too. I mean, that was a great movie. Thank you. That one, and that was a feature length film, 80 minutes. And in thinking about this project, the docu-series, we started putting it together and we realized, you know, it, it, we didn't want to make an 80 minute or 100 minute lecture on the grid. So we decided to break it into five parts. And I'm glad that we did because, you know, the world is moving towards shorter form content. And that's what we did here. You know, the grid is, is probably one of the largest machines. And I learned a lot from visiting with Meredith uh, Angwin and you on our podcast interview and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, we need all forms of energy. And, you know, Robert, you have talked extensively about the high cost of not having a balanced grid. Sure. And it's one of the points that I, you know, we strove to make in the docu series was to let people understand how complex the system is, and it is incredibly complex. Um, in fact, I did a Substack on it not too long ago, and I, I called the, uh, the 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 electric grid explained in ten charts, and so I just made ten charts to try and say, well, here's what it is. But you think about it, you have over three thousand different electricity providers in America. So you have the federal power agencies, Bonneville, TVA, uh, yeah. Western. Power Administration, et cetera. Then you have uh, a, about 180 investor-owned utilities like yep. Duke or uh, uh, no, any of the other ones, Consolidated Edison. Um, then you have 2,000 community-owned utilities like Austin Energy. I live in Austin, Texas. It's city-owned right. utility. Or, and 800 and some odd, 850 electric cooperatives. So you take all those together, and it's just this incredibly complex system that then is overseen by public utility commissions at the state level. You got the RTOs and the ISOs. You have uh, the different uh, uh, yeah. cities and jurisdictions, and then you have the Department of Energy. You have FERC. You have all these things. But ultimately, 
key points we made in the docuseries, uh, Stu, is just that no one is responsible for reliability. And that's the key issue. And it's being misrepresented, uh, the greenwashing uh, from the renewable side is not having an open discussion. You're really big into open discussions about this stuff. You know, let's talk about a plan because it yeah. makes sense to have the plan. Well, and that is what we hope to achieve with the docuseries is to ignite more conversation. We want people to understand what's going on. And that's essential. We we can't begin to address the reliability issue if people don't understand what is at stake and or understand what the system right. is. That's why we're giving the film away, right? You're giving all five episodes away. They're free on YouTube. Right. You can link to them, as I said, on juicetheseries.com. We have other content, short form content there with short, you know, shorter interviews, different people. Um, but we want to change the conversation. You know, we want people to understand what the hell is going on here. And um, and unfortunately, many people don't. And that's one of great, uh, you know, you and I are both fans of Meredith Angwin, you right. know, and what a remarkable story she has that here she is, this grandmother in her late seventies and lives in rural Vermont. She self publishes her book, Shorting the Grid. And not overnight, but in the span of six to nine, 12 months, she becomes an internationally recognized expert on electricity and electricity grids. And it's just a, uh, it's a testament to both her own fortitude and her own intelligence and her own grit. Um, but also a really, uh, I think a charming story because she's oh, absolutely. And her husband's a cool cat too. She's so personally charming and self-effacing, but she also had this motivation to help try and change the conversation. So uh, she's, you know, we have 34 interviews on camera for the five episodes. Uh, nice. She's one of the stars, Chris Kiefer from Canada, uh, my friend Roger Pilkey Jr. from Colorado, uh, uh, Maddie Hilly, uh, I mentioned Chris Kiefer, uh, Michael right. Schellenberger, Ed Hers, uh, uh, John. I love Schellenberger. Yeah. He, he uh, is good too. When we sit back and think, um, what prompted you down your mission? Because like Chris, uh, right over at Energy has really formulated how my podcast has come to fruition. When I met him years ago, he had a great presentation of humanity. Yeah. And I had never really, that did not hit my, my, my brain. And all of a sudden, like electricity, juice makes a difference. It elevates people out of poverty and you had a great quote uh i believe in there and it was um uh, just because you have low cost energy doesn't mean uh that you will be elevated out of poverty or something like this but yeah. if you don't have it you won't be <laughs> but, yeah i think i said electricity doesn't guarantee wealth but the absence of electricity always thank you poverty yeah and and I think one of the other things that we really are trying to achieve with both, the, well, we achieved it, I think, with the first film and with this one, too, Stu, is pointing out the issue of energy poverty is key. And right. particularly focused on uh, the issue of electricity for women and girls. And it's in the first film, we make yes. that electricity liberates women and girls from the pump, the stove, and the wash tub. And, um, and in, in the docuseries, we go back to the new deal as well, because this is, and it's a point I make in my, my latest book, uh, question of power, what, what yep. motivated the new dealers like, uh, uh, George Norris and Burton Wheeler and, uh, uh, and Sam Rayburn during the new deal to uh, push for rural electrification. A lot of it was their concern for farm women, you know, Rayburn, yes. Rayburn grew up in Bonham, Texas on a cotton on a cotton farm, and he saw his mother wash clothes by hand. And the same with uh, with George Norris. And so, yeah. um, you know, my my grandmother washed clothes by hand. You know, this isn't ancient history that that what we're talking no. about. So the the you know the the key to elevating human lives, and that's what uh, bettering human lives is what Chris Wright talks about in in Liber at Liberty Energy, right. This is the form of energy we crave over every other. And so with this docuseries, we want to keep that focus, that spotlight on electricity, because this is the most, our, the, and the grid, because it's our most important energy network. Um, I, I'd been uh, talking about the uh, vulnerability of the grid for several years. Yeah. And uh, the Wall Street Journal, not the Wall Street, but uh, somebody had put out that there are over 30 major interconnects uh, that are made by China. And yeah. then we have, you know, 
uh, then we had the spy balloon come over and then they said, oh, by the way, this thing was uh, connected to the U.S. Uh, Internet provider. Um, it's kind of frightening uh, that they can remotely shut down, what, 20, 30 percent of the grid, whatever the number is. It's frightening. Yeah, I don't know about those numbers. I'm not familiar with that. I, exactly. I, we, those are not documented. So just a lot. But there's no doubt that the grid is vulnerable. And, you know, we focus primarily on uh, the the changing resource mix, because this is one of the issues that uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation has has pointed out over and over again. And um, but, you know, remember, we have a whole bunch of NGOs that are now trying to undermine the grid. And, and you know, yes. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I pointed out, I spoke at the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners in Washington the other morning and pointed yep. out that the uh, Beyond Carbon campaign just got $500 million from Michael Bloomberg. Well, what's their goal? It's to shut down every coal plant in America and half of the gas plants in America. I mean, this is just an incredibly dangerous uh, proposition. And you know, the, the NGOs, the climate NGOs had a hissy fit that I would dare mention this because I pointed out that this is a national security risk. It is. And yet they just, you know, oh, how dare you, you know, point this out. How dare you say that if a terrorist group was proposing this, they that would be viewed as a national security threat. Well, that's the reality. It wouldn't be viewed as a national security threat. But because it's Michael Bloomberg, one of the richest people in the world saying this, crickets, you know, it's like, oh, he's a rich guy. You know, we don't talk about that. But it's, you know, these are very serious issues. And that's, again, yes. why Tyson Culver, my colleague, uh, who did a great job putting the docuseries together, it was really what m helped motivate us to get this film done was, you know, we got blacked out in Austin in, in 2021 during Winter Storm Uri. And oh, yeah. yeah, that was tough. And in the aftermath, it, it was clear, you know, ERCOT came within four or five minutes of a complete shutdown. Well, had that happened, tens of thousands of people would have died. Exactly. So, um, you know, there's the, 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 the danger here is obvious and it is one that is very, right. uh, very clear and FERC, NERC, the RTOs, they're all pointing this out and they're saying the same things and we need to pay attention. Um, a, a couple things. Um, what about, was it the Canadian leader? I just read the article on where he said they weren't, they're proposing something where if you even mentioned good things about fossil fuel, it would be a crime. Yeah. I, grief. I, I saw the headline on that. And I, you know, this is uh, it was, a, it was a very concerted effort to limit speech in this country and elsewhere around issues around climate and renewables and the rest of it. And it's very dangerous uh, prospect. And uh, right. Emmett, my friend Emmett Penny has a very good piece on Substack about that today. But uh, we need more discussion. We need more open and aggressive debate. Instead, we're, you know, we see the yes. other, uh, the the uh, activists um, who are nominally liberals trying to shut down debate. Right. Um, I have both of your books uh, uh, at my office in uh, Dallas, and uh, I'm up here, uh, up at my place in Oklahoma over at Lake Tinkiller. So, um, and I noticed, if you notice my hat, I put my cowboy hat back here behind me, because when you walked out the door in that 2019 movie, you had my hat sitting there. So uh, I just feel very proud that my hat made it into your first movie. So <laughs> now when we sit back and take a look, Robert, I just want for our uh, podcast listeners, you are solving a major problem by articulating facts, uh, facts, facts, physics and uh sustainability through fiscal responsibility matter and you are getting that story out there just about better than anybody else i've seen out there well i'm i'm working hard Stu, and i appreciate that that's a very kind thing to say um i busted my tail i mean you know i work a, a lot and uh i'm producing a lot of content whether it's video or podcast i do a lot of speaking yep. 20 some odd speaking engagements on my calendar this year um, already wow. and uh, travel screenings, um, you know, and my Substack, stack, Robert Bryce.substack.com. And now I'm promoting the film as well. So, <laughs> um, but also Stuart, I'm, you know, I'm very lucky in what I do. I'm, I'm, 
incredibly fortunate to have the work that I have. And I, this is my purpose and my passion. I don't do anything else. I mean, I've, I have a great family. I'm incredibly fortunate. My wife, Lauren, and I've been married almost 38 years. Um, you know, I'm just incredibly fortunate to do what I do and to be yep. able to talk about energy and power systems. And uh, I consider myself incredibly but, lucky. But you're good at what you do, Robert, with your passion. And so it's the old story of do, uh, you know, what you're passionate about. And it's not a job. Yeah. Well, it's a job. I'm not going to say it's not a job. <laughs> I get it. I kind of worn out today because I've been traveling a lot. But, you know, I, I, what, I, what motivates me, Stuart, is, you know, I spend a lot of time in rural America. And I... Right a lot of time talking to small cooperatives and uh public power entities and i'm and who do i who do i hope to speak for who do i hope to represent when i talk about affordability and resilience and reliability it's not the fat cats it's not the the people on no. in disco or new york or you know in washington dc it's the people who actually work for a living who make things build things grow things fix things right. people who have their names on their shirts I love those people and they are not represented in Washington to any great degree. They are ignored. And yep. so that's, that's who I hope to speak for and, and speak up uh, on behalf of, because, you know, the, the, we have a lot of very elite people who's only, whose only focus is on, you know, eliminating CO2 and, and, and fighting against right. the carbons and, but they aren't really, the people who make this country work and they, they have completely lost touch with the working class. And it's a very dangerous thing. And so uh, I, I hope, and I, it's one of the reasons that one of the mo things that motivates me is we need a more balanced approach to what, where we are in this country. Well, um, deindustrialization is happening very, very badly to poor old Germany with their energy policies. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I don't, you know, feel you I don't feel sorry for them at all. I, you know, if I were a better person, a better Christian, maybe a better Catholic, I'd feel sorry for Germany and the rest of Europe. I don't, you know, you, like it in the ditch. <laughs> you bragged about how fast you were going into the ditch and how great it was. I hope you like it there because, you know, you did it to yourself. No one told you to do this. You did it to yourself. No. So tough tookie, you know, call me, tell me how, how do you like it? And then Doug Sandridge went out there when they shut their last nukes down. And then the hypocrisy uh, of uh, Greta going to a German uh, coal plant that they were forcing to shut down. And I think six months later, they had to uh, shut down the wind farm that was there so they could dig more coal under the wind farm. You can't buy this kind of lunacy. Uh, that's the Garsweiler lignite mine. And I think it's part of the that, oh, that operates one of the, uh, the power plants there, if I'm not mistaken, but it's a, it's a very large lignite mine, which of course is a low rank coal and produces more CO2 than perhaps any other form of electricity generation. No way. What is Germany doing? You know, their energy security is coming first. They're putting energy security ahead of concerns about CO2 and climate change. So they're expanding the lignite mine. And to expand the lignite mine, what did they have to do? They had to take down a wind project. I mean, you can't make that up. I am, I am, I'm going to just be honest. Uh, I am more aligned with Chris uh, and the humanitarian and your humanitarian uh, statements. I'm energy agnostic. However, it has to be sustain, uh, sustainable through not printing money. Yeah. And um, the wind farms, boy, if we could fix the, re the recyclable aspect of solar panels, the recyclable aspect of like the boneyard of all the wind farm uh, stuff in Texas, I'd be more aligned with not having to print money. If it was, you know, taken along like that, it would make more sense. Wouldn't it? Well, you hit on um, a lot of issues that are being ignored, you know, which is <laughs> in, in life for a lot of this uh, alternative technology, alternative energy stuff. Um, you know, the, the amount of uh, potential solid waste here is just staggeringly large. And there was a Harvard Business School study that was done uh, about a year, a year and a half, two years ago, maybe, that found that by 20, as early as 2040 or something like that, that the volume of 
solar panels that are being thrown out will the the uh, rather the mass the weight will exceed all of the the new panels coming into the market so yeah. we're facing this tidal wave of of alt energy trash that is going to have to be landfilled and we're already seeing that with a lot of these wind turbine blades that are being either dumped out in the middle of 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 rural areas and i saw this i did a short uh tiktok i do you know i use my phone and i do these short videos and, and those are great by the way i don't want to cut you off but those are great and meaningful sorry one near sweetwater texas and and I, I I did it in about ten minutes, and that got one hundred and sixty thousand views. I mean, it's just incredible. But it's because they're these big waste dumps of 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 wind turbine blades. They're just being thrown out and and laying on the ground and not being recycled. You know, how is this green? How is this clean? It's not. Oh, I don't I don't use those terms anymore, Stu. I don't. It's not. It's not clean. It's no. not green. It's not renewable. It's alternative energy. All those other things are marketing terms. Green, clean, renewable, those are marketing terms. I don't right. use them. It's alternative energy. You know, I've been digging around and- uh, Fossil fuels either. I call them hydrocarbons. Uh, yes, they are. Yes, I agree with you. Who, I uh, was it Rockefeller or whoever coined the term fossil fuels to try to put a thing, whoever that was, but- uh, I can't find any data, Robert. And when I'm sitting here looking at it, everybody says a wind farm is going to last 30 years as hogwash. Um, they are fiscally irresponsible from day one, but I've been finding that they've been having real problems maintenance wise, starting in year seven, when the warnings are running out. And then the expense of all the maintenance is coming in. And so at 10 years, they are totally needing to be shut down. And then I'm also seeing that at the Inflation Reduction Act, and I believe I stole this from you, but um, the, they're starting to redo these things at five years and six years. So the consumers get to pay twice for these things through the taxes and everything else. Did I assume that correctly? Oh, I, I, you're on the right track here. The a lot of these projects, these wind projects, they're doing what's called repowering. So they're putting new turbines uh, in the nacelle, uh, taking down the old nacelles, putting up new ones with new guts, new mechanics, new machinery that's more efficient than the old one. And so then they not only get a, a more efficiency out of the existing tur uh, the existing site, right. but they restart the clock on the tax credits. So you know, again. Uh, I can't be any more cynical about this than I am. I don't, I don't <laughs> a lot of money that's being thrown into alternative energy is the story. And to me, it, it, it indicates this isn't about climate change. It doesn't have anything to do with climate change. It's about the money period. It follow the money. And I spoke, I mentioned at Nehruk um, earlier this week and I presented a slide and I made it very, you know, it's, it's not my numbers, the numbers, the, in 2022, the solar sector got 300 times more in federal tax credits per unit of energy produced than the nuclear sector. 300 times, 302 yeah. times, and 100 uh, and wind got 136 times more than oil and gas. So, this idea that oil and gas is getting you know these insanely large subsidies is just not true. It's a it's a it's a fiction that's being promoted by some very powerful NGOs that have a lot of money, but. You know, the reality is we're getting, and this goes back to the docu-series, juicetheseries.com. Did I mention juicetheseries.com? I love it. But that we're, 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 we're spending all this money and we're putting it in the wrong places. Instead of making right. our more weather resilient, we're making it weather dependent. That's the wrong way to go. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, David Blackman uh, also had a couple good points uh, along that same line, but it, it's not also follow the money it's uh i he's called it even a like a wealth transfer because yeah. you got rich uh doing it but that cost is being <clears throat> people are getting screwed look at new york um prices for electricity and california prices for electricity yeah. now texas prices have gone up a lot but we're still half of what they are yeah and I just the uh, new electric power monthly just came out. And so we have the, the full year data for 2023 um, electricity prices in California since 2008, when Schwarzenegger right. uh, put in the new or mandated renewables have gone up at a rate three times faster than the rest of the U S as a whole. 
Um, so this wow. is not, not a coincidence. Just the increase, again, just the increase in electricity prices for residential customers in California between 2008 and 2023 went up 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. So, you know, the uh, that the average price, I, 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 I need to study these numbers again or look at them again, but uh, um, yeah, here it is. They went up in cents per kilowatt hour. The increase in California was 15, 15 cents. That was a bigger increase than any other state in the country by far. Um, and compared to the U.S. whole, it was less than five cents. So more than triple the increase uh, rate of increase uh, over the rest of the U.S. Um, and also last year in California, the rates went up uh, nearly 12 percent, 11.9 percent. So wow. you know, rates are just skyrocketing. Um, they, they went up double the rate of increase of the U.S. as a whole last year. Um, and, you know, right now, the average price of electricity in California for residential users is 29 cents a kilowatt hour. Right. Um, that's that's nearly twice the national average. And, and what's Texas? Uh, my dad has a contract that's ending uh, at 11 cents per kilowatt hour, and they're really wanting him out of that one. So I think that's a good price. Yeah. Um, Let me see. I've got a. Um, oh, where is that? Uh, here's right here i've got it right in front of me um yeah the average now in texas is 14.3 right um and so his contract is several years old and it's about to end let me ask this of you robert i really want your opinion um now that the wind farms are you know we ha we've seen so many uh of the wind farms either offshore or others that are uh, absolutely losing so much money and like Siemens lost what a billion or two, what's a few billion between friends. Uh, and what's your subset, uh, what's your website again, juice, uh, Robert Bryce.substack.com. Right. So, uh, that way people can come, you know, get you, you know, we need a billion subscribers for you. But if you take a look at the billions that is lost in the wind industry and people are leaving the amount of articles and things that are coming in for carbon tax yeah. for you think it almost looks like the entire market for wealth transfer, as David Blackman has been talking about is <laughs> shifting to carbon tax and you have the, all this kind of stuff. Do you see that same focus going as, as bad as it was on that and carbon taxes and all of that <laughs> stuff? Well, Carbon taxes, I'm not very bullish on because they're so deeply unpopular. So oh, I would they're awful. <laughs> wager a lot of money that we're going to see a, a significant carbon tax of anyone ever, uh, because um, it's uh, it's very difficult to get uh, political support for that. Um, but I think that there, you know, there are a lot of moves afoot now that are going to result in regressive taxation on low and middle income Americans. There's just no doubt about it. Wow. Uh, so back to the you know the docu series. Um, the one of the points that I think is interesting is that when you look at um, the uh, electricity price or electricity availability and electricity reliability, right. what are what are consumers doing? They're buying Generacs. Well, uh, you know, so because they know that the reliability of the grid is declining. Well, the average household income for a Generac buyer is one hundred forty five thousand dollars a year. So. What does that tell you? It tells you that wealthy folks can protect themselves, insulate themselves to some degree from these deleterious effects of this uh, of the this uh, undermining of the grid. Poor folks can't. You know, low income folks don't buy Generax; they can't afford them. You know, no. the same electric vehicles. I've been in the barrio. I've been in the hood. There are there are no Teslas in the barrio. Those people are just lucky to buy gasoline for their you know their older vehicles. They don't own electric cars, so. I look at all of this policy, Stu, uh, nearly all of it with regard to the climate change. It's all regressive. It all screws the poor and the middle class. It's all terrible for them. You know, uh, I'm sitting up here with my four buildings and I've got two generators and they're out in the shop and uh, the two generators can run. Any one of them can run two or three of the buildings. And so your answer is right. Uh, I can survive a uh, down grid and I do have some solar just to keep it in case I can't get gas or, you know, that kind of propane. So uh, there, I kind of like me some propane. <laughs> yeah. As long as you got three tanks, it's not a bad thing. 
Propane is Chris's favorite hydrocarbon, so you can remind him of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> C3, but, C3H8. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a great last mile. Uh, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, I'm, I'm out here uh, and we, we got bears and mountain lions. And if, if a zombie apocalypse happened, I would be okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. But now you're in Austin, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to come buy you a steak sometime. Cause I just really appreciate you and everything that you're doing. So next time that you're up in either the Dallas area as well, I'm also in uh, Abilene a bunch. My other office is, is in Abilene. So I'm either in Abilene, Dallas, or here. So, okay. uh, but I'm not traveling to India and all of the other places that you did in your first movie. So I got a little ways to catch up with you. No problem. What is coming around the corner for Robert Bryce? Well, I hope just more of the same, Stu. I don't, you know, I, uh, what do I want? I want what I have. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need a new car. I don't want a new house. I, I want right. to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, what I do is my purpose and my passion. I, I read about, I talk about, I write about, I uh, speak about, uh, the energy and power sectors. And that's all I do. I'm, you know, I'm you're, very, you're good at it. Very fortunate in my, in my, my life and my family, my, you know, my kids are all healthy and happy. They're grown. Um, got a, you know, wonderful woman I've been married to almost 38 years, you know, so I'm incredibly fortunate. So I just want to be able to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to keep promoting this docuseries because of all the effort we put into it. And so, um, I'm, I, I'm not, it's not that I don't have ambition, but my ambition is just the, to keep the, what I have that I don't, I don't need anything else. I don't need a fancy gear car. I don't need something. I just want to be able to keep doing what I'm doing. I absolutely love that. And, and when you're, you are absolutely fulfilling something critical. Uh, I'm also working with a bunch of uh, trying to get homeschooling uh, content for any podcast so that I can pay for content to give to um, homeschoolers because the education system is busted and not teaching facts um you know they're not teaching physics and they're not teaching fiscal responsibility around energy so i'm trying yeah. to marry that group as well too which is kind of fun so yeah. uh, i can't wait to also visit by the time this airs though robert you and i would have already talked on the energy realities with uh irena slav and uh david blackman and tammy nemeth and i just want to again thank you for stopping by the podcast today Always a pleasure, Stu, and uh, you know, happy to talk anytime. You know, we're like-minded on this. This is uh, this is what motivates us. And so, and what was your website again? Uh, I'm on Substack, so you can't miss me on the interweb, Stu. I'm easy to find. Uh, uh, the docu series, juicetheseries.com. Did I mention juicetheseries.com? Bryce.substack.com. <laughs> I'm on Twitter at PowerHungry. I'm on TikTok. Yeah, I'm on TikTok at Power <laughs> I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, you can't miss me. Uh, and I appreciate you. Thanks.